This is Heather Vokush, and welcome. Today we're going to talk about NYU's horrific expansion plan into Greenwich Village. Now, possibly you've heard about it, possibly you haven't, but this is something that we must talk about. It's a very, very, very important issue for people inside New York and indeed everywhere. Now, essentially, New York University has planned this massive expansion into Greenwich Village. It's a move that uh, threatens the Sasaki Gardens, the um, Key Park Children's Playgrounds, and many other local treasures. Now, over 40 groups are fighting this, saying that it threatens not only the village, but also NYU itself. Now, today we are very thrilled to be joined by Bo Riccobono, a member of the NYU Faculty Against the Sexton Plan, and also Andrew Berman, who is Executive Director of the Greenwich Village Society for Historic Preservation. So, gentlemen, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Thanks for having now, us. I have to tell you, I mean, the more that I have read about this, the stupider this plan seems, you know? I mean, it just, I don't see that it has a lot of common sense or, or relevance, and it just, it seems very, very dangerous. So what I want to do is to start possibly from a reverse perspective. I'm gonna give you a very difficult job. Let's say that you are the spokesperson for um, John Sexton, who is the president of uh, New York University, and the plan is na named after him. Can you give us just a couple of points, talking points, that he would say it's a good idea to do this? Well, first of all, the plan is not named after him. It's, it's called NYU 2031. Our mm -hmm. group has his name in the title to make the point that, that, uh, that NYU is not the fact, you know, the, the people pushing the plan is the, mm -hmm. are, are the people in the administration. Mm -hmm. The faculty is against this plan, which okay. is a very, very important point, okay. that the faculty of NYU is against the plan. But can you first give us his talking Yeah, about? so what, yeah. What, what Sexton would say, obviously, is obvious to me, is that this is a great plan because it, it, uh, NYU is a very large employer in New York City, mm -hmm. that any expansion of economic activity in, NY, in New York City is a good thing for everybody, mm -hmm. and that that, um, that according to, to Sexton, uh, NY, um, um, universities need to expand. They have to keep expanding and they have to uh, keep growing to be competitive. Almost like a metastasizing cancer, one could uh, well, say. <laughs> that's what I would say, but I mean, that's not what he would say. Possibly not the image he would use. Right. Okay, so that would be his points. Now, who else is, you know, in favor of this? What other kinds of groups? Right. Well, it basically seems to be um, the administration of NYU, not its student body, not its mm -hmm. staff workers who came out against it, not mm -hmm. its graduate workers who came out against it, certainly not its faculty. Mm -hmm. Department after department came out against the plan. Mm -hmm. So it seems to be the administration and their very powerful and well-connected board, um, mm -hmm. the editorial boards of some of the newspapers in New York City that are particularly supportive of big business. Okay. And ultimately, they held sway with the city council and the city planning commission. Mm -hmm. Certainly, the impacted... Uh, community was uh, against it, uh, you know, more than 99% uh, against mm -hmm. it. And then there were even um, activists from neighborhoods across the city who came out against it saying, we see the dangerous precedent that this would set. We mm -hmm. see the way this undermines what should be good planning principles for the city of New York. It, it's, it's bad clearly for this neighborhood, mm -hmm. but it has bad implications for our neighborhoods as well. Okay, well, let's go back to the city council. What would their points be for why this is a good idea? idea. You know, it, I, I think they would probably echo what, what Bo just said was the points mm -hmm. that Sexton made. But, you know, what was interesting is we sort of took um, Sexton's talking points almost as a given. We said, okay, okay. let's assume NYU has to grow. Mm -hmm. It's the right thing for New York City to end, for NYU to grow. NYU mm -hmm. needs more facilities, et cetera. Mm -hmm. Let's look at what the right way is for NYU to do okay. that and the wrong way. Okay. Let's look at what other cities have done when they've faced the same challenge, mm -hmm. which is that you have a growing unit university in the middle of an older residential urban neighborhood. Mm -hmm. There's limits to how much growth they can take, mm -hmm. but you want this source of economic development. Mm -hmm. How do you make that work and not destroy the neighborhood that's played host to it, in this case for nearly two centuries? And if you look at what Brown did, Harvard, Yale, many other schools across the country, mm -hmm. what they said was, we recognize the limits of how much we can grow in our original location. Mm -hmm. We have to look for things like satellite campuses mm -hmm. that can be located in parts of the 
city where it makes sense for this kind like of thing. Like the financial district. Like the financial right. district, yeah. which was one of the first places that we put out there. Mm -hmm. Leaders in the financial district said that's a great idea. We'd mm -hmm. love to have NYU mm -hmm. consider locating here. The type of development they want to do fits in with the mix that we want downtown. Mm -hmm. It's contextual in scale. There's limitless possibilities for growth. Mm -hmm. But um, Sexton and the NYU administration refused to consider it. The city council, the city planning commission, all um, you know, just w would not even consider the possibility, even though it clearly was a successful model from other cities mm -hmm. and would have, by virtue of a report that we commissioned by independent analysts, mm -hmm. had uh, produced much more economic activity, been much more beneficial in exactly the ways that Sexton claimed this is what New York City needs. Now, is that kind of thing that makes me think, okay, so there must be some money to be made, and this is why they want to have it where it is, because this is the point that it just is not logical. And so what would you say, those are the talking points, but what are the underlying meta points that actually are not being spoken about? What would well, you say? Well, I mean, there, there are a lot of things, you know, but, but uh, mainly the, um, what I think happened is, for one thing you have on, on, the, uh, on the Board of Trustees of NYU, you have many, many of the biggest names in real estate okay. in, in the city of New York. And I think these people, you know, they, they, are, they have big egos, and I think they looked around the campus, and they all sort of, you know, uh, elbow each other, and they say, hey, look at this, you know, we could build this here, and we could do that, and we could, uh, you know, do this. And, the, and, and as, as a university, university has, has a lot of leverage in getting zoning changes. Mm -hmm. And most of these people, you know, because they are experienced developers, they know that they, as a private developer, never could get what NYU can get as an institution. Mm -hmm. So I think that was a big part of it. And I think that, that Sexton and, and the, his people in his administration, again, they, they, they're they kind of power hungry and egomania, you know, in, uh, e egomaniacal. And mm -hmm. They, they, they live in a bubble where they only talk to themselves, and, and I think they, um, they just thought this is a great idea. And, and, and people feel, you know, it's when you're, you're, you know something that other people don't know. You know, you're the smartest guy in the room. That, a lot of that was going on, mm -hmm. and, and it, it, it doesn't make sense. You, you mm -hmm. make that point. It just doesn't make sense. For, from, a, from a logical perspective, but I'm wondering if from a pardon me, but a corrupt business perspective, possibly it does make sense to certain people. And so what I'm wondering is, who owns this actual land? NYU owns the land? Well, the, here's an interesting point, and this dovetails what uh, Bo was saying. I, I think a lot of what this is about is to NYU, this just felt like the quickest, most expedient way of doing it. Mm -hmm. They There is this land much but not all of which they own, mm -hmm. quote unquote. And I put that okay. in quotes because okay. this was formerly publicly owned land that mm -hmm. was given to NYU two generations ago in the 1950s and 1960s as part of an urban renewal plan with very, very strict restrictions attached to it. So Sasaki Garden officially mm -hmm. NYU owns. That's right. They own the land that it's on. But again, it's this okay. formerly publicly owned land mm -hmm. given to NYU. People, there used to be uh, residences and businesses that were mm -hmm. cleared from this land. Okay. People lost their homes and their businesses because the city said, this is in the greater public interest. You have to sacrifice your homes and business, okay. but here's what we're giving to the city of New York in return. Okay. And part of it was supposed to be the perpetual preservation of this open space. Mm -hmm. Part of it was that the land was only supposed to be used for academic purposes. Much of what NYU is proposing to put on there is runs completely contrary to what the original deal was. Oh, okay. Part of the land is not owned by NYU. It's still city-owned land mm -hmm. that's been used as dog runs, playgrounds, parks, things that the Greenwich Village neighborhood are desperately lacking in and really, really need. Mm -hmm. So I think from NYU's perspective, they said, well, here's this land. Sure, we're never supposed to touch it, but if we could, that would be so much easier than having to find a new space, whether it's in the financial district or wherever else, even if that long term would serve us better, would certainly serve the city better, and clearly would serve Greenwich Village better, but it would be so much easier if we could just convince the city to mm -hmm. change the rules okay. to make this as simple and easy as possible if for us. If we can kind of strong arm our way through it, and then people right. won't know until after it's done. And so what I'm hearing both of you say is that there is some kind of legal Leeway, and I understand that you have hired Gibson, Dunn, and Crutcher to represent your case. And so, how how is that case going? You know. And my question is, who is paying for this? How how do you get the cash for the legal representation? 
Well, it, it, it's on a partial pro, uh, pro, pro bono, bono basis. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, it's, thank goodness. Thank yeah. goodness, beca because I mean, this is a very high-powered firm, and they throw yeah. everything they have at it, mm -hmm. and uh, we could never afford it. So mm -hmm. it's partial pro bono, big part mm -hmm. pro bono. Um, and what else did you ask me? Well, my question is, how much legal leeway do you have? What I'm hearing there is in the original contract, if, if you will, there are certain things that you can and cannot do, and possibly what they're planning they can't do, unless they can some kind of strong arm. So how good is your case? In yeah, court? I mean, I can't talk right now about legal strategy, but what I can say is that under New York State law, uh, under what they call Article 78, any any uh, decision of a municipal agency can be challenged in, okay. s in state court. The, it's a very high bar. You have to prove that the decision was arbitrary and capricious, mm -hmm. which is a very high bar. But as someone who has been involved in this process, uh, the, the, it's called the Uniform Land Use Revi Re Review Procedure, mm -hmm. ULERP. Mm -hmm. um, from the beginning, I know they made tremendous number of mistakes in, mm -hmm. in the way they, they handle it, and they violated the open meetings law. I mean, it was just unbelievable. Is so it mistakes, or do you think it was done on purpose? Well, I think they were steamrollering this okay. through, okay. and they they are laboring under the impression that there will be no uh, credible opposition, that they can do what they want. I mean, this was mm -hmm. frankly very clearly supported by the mayor and the, and the city planning commission. Mm -hmm. So they thought, well, you know, we can just play fast and loose with the rules, and I think they did. Mm -hmm. right. Even before the vote took place, the mayor, who appoints the majority of the members of the City Planning Commission, mm -hmm. came out and said, I think NYU should get everything that they're asking for, and I think that anybody who's telling them that they should get less is basically crazy. <laughs> um, and, you know, there was a process that preceded this for several years where NYU was involved in conversations with community groups like mine and many, many others, the community board, elected officials, and, you know, it became very clear to us throughout this uh, process that mm -hmm. it was really all about um, steamrolling the plan mm -hmm. so that NYU could get what they want mm -hmm. um, to really silence and to try to co-opt the opposition, which ultimately mm -hmm. was not willing to be co-opted. Um, so it was a very, uh, to say that the process was flawed from the beginning in every respect, I think would be a vast understatement. And, you know, I think the problem is that NYU does not have the best reputation as far as keeping its promises in these areas. You've got the Provincetown Playhouse, you've got the Poe House, and they say that they aren't going to harm things, and then later on, oopsie, I guess we did, you know, what can we do now? And so this this also is, you know, if, if they had a reputation for having kept their promises, then that would be one thing, but they don't. No, they're, they're terrible stewards of the community. I mean, they have no conception of, of their role in the community. And let, you know, let's remember that NYU was for many years a commuter school. Mm -hmm. And then in, uh, you know, maybe about 20 years ago, they made a decision to try to increase uh, enrollment. So they're trying to shoehorn uh, the facilities of, of a, I think they have about 40,000 students now. I mean, into a very small, not just a small area, but in a historic district in New York City. Mm -hmm. and, and the reason I think that the city fathers are extremely short-sighted, one of the many reasons is that many people come to New York. W one of the attractions is Greenwich Village and the low-rise aspect. Aspect right. of Greenwich Village, and thanks to Andrew and his group, you know, we we we've retained a lot more of that than we would have, and 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 NYU is not aware of that. They use in their promotional material pictures of Washington Square Park looking north, <laughs> because the south side they've completely ruined with their large buildings. Yeah. But so they use it simultaneously as, as a carrot, and then they have no respect <laughs> for for what they're doing to it. Yeah. It's, it's it's really so. You wonder if it's they're not stupid. So, you know, why do they do these things? I think another element, too, is that if indeed this kind of construction does take place, what student wants to go to a school in, that's a construction site and what professor wants to teach there. And so in a way, it's like the poison pill. You're killing yourself. Not only are you destroying, you know, this beautiful neighborhood, but who wants to study in a construction site? You know, if you look at the experience of other schools, for instance, so ha Harvard embarked on this enormous expansion plan a few weeks ago. The, you know, the financial crisis of 2008 happened. Now, Harvard is many times over more wealthy than NYU. So mm -hmm. they were in a much stronger position to 
be able to weather that storm. And still, what it meant was, as they were in the middle of doing this expansion, it all came to a screeching halt. There were these huge holes in the ground from where they were planning these enormous new facilities. Okay. Now, for, for better or worse, and from some people's perspective, I'm sure it was better, others worse, it was not in the middle of the Harvard campus. It was in Austin, okay. a distance away, in what was a formerly industrial area. Mm -hmm. So it didn't disturb the continuing function of the campus. Mm -hmm. Now, if NYU, which has a um, an endowment that is a fraction of the side, size of Harvard's, yeah. hits financial trouble in the course of this 20-year plan where they're going to be <laughs> digging up and just turning into a, an enormous construction zone, not only where their faculty live, mm -hmm. but where, where their students go to school, and beyond that, where thousands of people live in mm -hmm. very, very close proximity, mm -hmm. that is going to be an unmitigated disaster. Mm -hmm. And it's a real possibility that should have been considered, mm -hmm. but which was completely ignored. So, I mean, we're talking about the downfall, not only possibly of Greenwich Village, but of NYU itself. Well, I mean, but, it really is something of a suicidal move when you look at it. It could be. Yeah, I mean, we, we, we really think that NYU has, has very, very bad finances. We've mm -hmm. repeatedly asked for them to open their books. Mm -hmm. uh, 37 departments of NYU have now voted, academic departments have voted against the plan, okay. including the Stern School of Business okay. and the Economics Department, which has three Nobel Prize winners. Yeah. They they have called for NYU to open their books to explain the financing and they refuse to do it. And we, we really we have uh, um, we have some pretty good knowledge of the fact that they are in very poor financial condition. And this leads me again to one of their motive motives for this, which is they they will they're intending to increase uh, enrollment. Um, they want to use relatively cheap money from the New York State Dormitory Authority to build dorms, oh, okay. then they will um, accept more students and, and more and more students who pay very high tuitions. They go after uh, tuition paying students from all over the world. Mm -hmm. They provide very little financial aid. Uh, the, the students are, 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 they're really relying on student debt. Mm -hmm. They're relying, and, and this country is about to now have a, another uh, explosion, like similar to the housing bu bubble, mm -hmm. relating to student debt. Mm -hmm. The average, NYU is the highest, um, students from NYU graduate with the highest amount of student debt than any other private university in the country. Mm -hmm. But also, too, a lot of students, for example, I mean, I, I live outside of the states, a lot of students do not want to go to a school that is in the middle of a construction site. They don't tell anybody that. No, but I they mean, will. I mean, I mean, once the they'll students see hear it. about it. But let me just you know. say, they have, they're have they promoting heavily now an alumni event on October 20th. There is not one mention on that website. Uh, they're, ha they're having campus tours and symposia mm -hmm. and all kinds of activities for their al alumni. alumni. Mm -hmm. There's not one mention of 2031. Mm -hmm. they're, they're keeping this down low. Mm -hmm. You know, that's the point. They're, they're really, I think they're afraid to mention it because it's a third rail. This is my point. In terms of looking at it from the outside, I think clearly you have to fight this legal end, and it's great that you're doing this. But for me, from possibly just a brute force perspective, I think that just embarrassing the hell out of them, you know, and just somehow doing anything that just shines the light on this would be great. And so my question is, what, what can people out there watching this do on a concrete level to help? Sure. Well, I think the most important thing is to support the effort by the NYU faculty, by GBSHP, and by a growing number of groups that are going to be involved in this uh, legal challenge mm -hmm. of the approvals for the plan. Um, thousands and thousands of people participated in the fight going through the public review and approval process. We did it in good faith. We thought and hoped we would get a fair hearing, mm -hmm. that the issues that we were raising would really be heard and addressed addressed and considered. Unfortunately, the result clearly was that they were not. Um, so now we have to take it to the courts. It's mm -hmm. it's unfortunate when it comes to that, when it mm -hmm. falls on citizens to have to, you know, even uh, much more modestly than we otherwise would need to, but to raise funds in order to be able to ask the courts to take a look at and intervene um, in, with what our elected government and our appointed mm -hmm. government officials have done. But so people who want to get involved, they should go to the website of mm -hmm. uh, NYU 
faculty against the Sexton Plan, which mm -hmm. is nyufasp.com mm -hmm. or gvshp.org, mm -hmm. um, and they can find out more about how to get involved. We expect to be filing shortly for the suit, and once that's underway, there'll be additional ways in which people can help. We'll be looking for, um, you know, uh, briefs and support. Um, mm -hmm. There'll probably be some fundraising. There may well be hearings that people can turn out for. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, you mentioned um, embarrassing the university. I think the university has been embarrassed, and that's why they really tried to steamroll this through as quickly mm -hmm. as possible. They made it so that the hearings were in the dead of summer when much of the NYU community could right. not be there. And I think it was very embarrassing for them when their own um, professors, when their own mm -hmm. staff um, spoke up against this plan, said how they had not been involved in it, called them on the lies that they had been telling, saying, oh, we, we have a full roster of classes on Friday. I mean, this is one point that was raised, which, uh, though it's a small thing, I think it's <laughs> emblematic of the whole thing. NYU, for the most part, with very few exceptions, does not have classes on Friday. Mm -hmm. They are asking the public and the community to bear this huge burden to fund, um, to overturn existing agreements, to give public land in order to allow them to build new facilities, which if they just had Friday classes, uh -huh. many of them would not even be necessary. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. And that's just in some ways, okay. that's the tip of the iceberg yeah. and emblematic of the problem. And yeah. also, let me just say, the faculty developed an alternative plan, a green plan, mm -hmm. uh, that suggested ways that, that NYU could repurpose their administrative space in the mm -hmm. Washington Square area okay. to provide the, the classroom needs that they that they say they, they have. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was completely uh, unanswered. Mm -hmm. right. it, these administrators want to hold on to these plum spaces that they have with these you know spectacular beautiful views, offices. beautiful <laughs> offices. A lot of the administrative stuff doesn't need to be right in the campus core. Yeah. They could open up hundreds of thousands of square feet of space by moving certain things out of the core that don't need to be there, considering whether or not all of the schools that are located in the core make the most sense for there to be there. Mm -hmm. There was a, an array of options that were could have been considered that mm -hmm. were put on the table in good faith mm -hmm. um, that uh, drew on successful models elsewhere, mm -hmm. even right here in New York City, and both the university and our city government refused to consider it. What's it like to actually work there with all of this fighting going on? Well, no, it, it's really, it's a very, it's a toxic atmosphere. Yeah. And, and uh, you know, the people, we have a certain number of public members and a certain number of non-public members mm -hmm. because you have to remember that the faculty uh, uh, has as their employer and their landlord the right. same <laughs> the same company yeah. you know and that's and you know you can't you can't under underestimate the the power of that I mean yeah. pe people are afraid they're literally afraid mm -hmm. because there are ways in which the administration can get back at you. Mm -hmm. Uh, very little, sort of little ways, you know, requests for things. And then, of, not the big ones, of course, salary and, and, and your lease. You know, they, everybody's lease, uh, people, 40% of NYU faculty live on these super blocks. 40%. 40%. And they have no. Nobody has more, as far as I know, more than a three-year lease. Mm -hmm. So you know, it, yeah. they, 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 it's it's tenuous. It's very tenuous. And um, um, and so, do you get the case? And, and pardon me for interrupting, but for example, you're out there fighting, you know, in the front. But are there? people in the background who say, okay, well, you can use, you know, I'll sign something, yeah. but don't talk about me. And, oh, yeah. you know, That's so right. then that also creates groups within the opposition group. And, you know, you know, yeah. I'm, I'm not going to put my neck on the line. You go ahead and do it. And so that really would create, I think, something of an exhausting atmosphere, you know, to work in, which also doesn't help the professors and it doesn't help the students, you know. And so that's a different level of toxicity that this is creating. It just takes energy away from the beauty of education. Right. Right. Yeah. Well, I, I think that one thing that certainly we've heard from the faculty a lot is that they feel as though this is not a good expenditure of the university's resources. Mm -hmm. It's not what the university needs. Uh -huh. um, you know, I think the flip side of that, though, is what we've seen is this actually wonderful coming together of the faculty and the community, all realizing we're all treated the same way by the NYU <laughs> administration, which is that we're yeah. roundly ignored and, uh -huh. and belittled forever for daring to have an opinion other than what they think is correct mm -hmm. for us and our lives. I I think the faculty has certainly expressed that it's their fear that this will create uh, an undermining of everything that they love and care about and have invested in um, for the university. Um, but, uh, you know, as Bo said clearly, this is completely administration driven. Mm -hmm. It's not at all reflective of what the faculty of the broader NYU community wants. Would it help at all to just go after Sexton and have a vote of confidence? 
Well, I mean, the faculty is, is, is actively considering that. Mm -hmm. You know, pe people are reluctant to do that. Why? But because it's something, you know, if you, if you ask me, I, I would say why also. But, <laughs> but I just know, in talking to people, they just think that it's, it's a drastic move. It's sort of the nuclear option. And they wish that there were another way to, to approach this. And but, it's, it's their employer. I mean, as Bo said, yeah. you know, the fact that uh, so many faculty have come out publicly against this, I I'm amazed by it. I mean, I think that takes incredible bravery. Mm -hmm. um, and many, many others have participated in semi-public ways and some only in private ways. Mm -hmm. But, you know, as Bo said, this is this is your livelihood, this is your home, mm -hmm. this is potentially your future and your career. Mm -hmm. And I think that the university was counting on being able to use that to shut everybody up. Mm -hmm. And I think they've been very surprised that it, it has not okay. uh, done that. Would it be possible to landmark? some of these things like the Sasaki Gardens? Part of the site, um, the Silver Towers complex, it's mm -hmm. these two super blocks, is actually landmarked. And okay. because of that, we were, a we were able to force them to drop a plan for a 400 foot tall tower <laughs> that they wanted to build right in the middle of Silver Towers, right across from the Picasso sculpture. The Silver Towers, it's known as today, it's, it's, mm -hmm. it's three brutalist concrete, <laughs> no, no, that's it's an architectural term from, yeah. from the 1950s. Yeah. And, and they were designed by I.M. Pei. <laughs> Oh, okay. who, who's a noted architect, as yeah. of course you know. NYU proposed a fourth tower. He went to Pei, who, who's still living, mm -hmm. and, and uh, he said nothing for a while. So they went ahead with it, and they, and they started telling everybody that a, a Pei approves. And luckily, uh, right before it, it went to the city, to the Landmarks Preservation Commission, he wrote a letter, and he just trashed them. I mean, <laughs> and, and they had to withdraw it. But I mean, that's okay. that's that's the uh, that's the the lack of respect that they have for anything mm -hmm. that anybody who stands in their way. Right. And and this Landmarks Preservation uh, Unit that you said here, are they basically a, rubber stamping? Well, it's a city agency, so basically okay. they're controlled by the same folks who approve this plan. Mm -hmm. So there was actually a request that. Washington Square Village be landmarked. The State Historic Preservation Office, so a state agency, mm -hmm. which is more independent of the process, took a look at it and they said, yes, this is absolutely an extremely historically mm -hmm. significant site, but mm -hmm. the state doesn't actually have the power to landmark. Only the city does. Mm -hmm. And the city refused the request. They also refused our request, though they did landmark the three towers and the open space inside of it and the Picasso sculpture, so that is preserved. The edges of that complex, um, they did not not include in the landmark designation, which we thought was a mistake. Mm -hmm. um, and so it was those edges of the complex and then the entirety of Washington Square Village where NYU is trying to place all of these buildings. I would say that by any objective standards, the entirety of those two blocks should have been included in a landmark designation. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. But the process, as we've seen, is not a, an objective or a fair one. Okay, okay. And you know, for me, what's very interesting is because I have a lot of friends in New York, I'm, I'm actually not from here, nobody knows about this the, that I have spoken to. Now, some of my friends who work for NYU know about it, but I mean, clearly the media is somewhat complicit in not really reporting this. Mm. We you know. certainly want to get the word out there yeah. as much as possible. Yeah. Um, and that's something that the faculty and we have both been working on. Yeah, no, we, we've been getting the word out, but the, the problem is in New York City, you know, the, the, there's probably opposition to everything thing that anybody ever wants to build. <laughs> so people are kind of, you know, um, become immune to those kinds mm -hmm. of, of, of issues and, and they don't really look at it. They don't really pay attention.